<laughs> All right, so welcome to our uh, part two series of our Who is DFS? Today we're focusing on the treatment unit. So we've got Jessica Tyre, a treatment worker from Sussex County, who's going to chat with us. So Jessica, actually, do you mind just kind of starting out by introducing yourself, kind of tell us how long you've been with DFS and kind of what brought you here? <clears throat> sure. So I have been with DFS since 2013. Um, I started in the treatment unit. I've stayed in the treatment unit. Um, I, I, treatment is, is particularly difficult, a little more so than some of the other units. We stay involved with the families for a lot longer. You know, investigations is usually 30 to 60 days, but we keep the cases for, I mean, a year or more, especially when the kids are in care, um, you know, and we're going through the court proceedings and, and things of that nature. <clears throat> Um, I had no experience with this prior to, um, you know, coming to DFS. I was previously in like the restaurant, <laughs> restaurant business. So it was a, a, a total shift for me to come, you know, where you're, you're people pleasing all the time, you know, customers are always right to jump it over into this field where, you know, you, as a worker, you really have to put your foot down, um, with some of the clients and, you know, get, get them moving because some just drag their feet. Um, I really like my job, obviously, um, you know, you get some bad apples, but for the most part, you know, all the workers that I've ever worked with have, have really been in it for the kids, you know, at the end of the day. Um, so that's, that's me, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I love that you say you, you love your job because you, otherwise it, you have to love this job in order to do it. You really do. I mean, we don't get paid enough, you know, bottom line, there's no way that we ever, you know, could get paid enough to do this job. Um, you know, and we're, we're out there on the front lines. We're going into these people's homes. We're, you know, we're removing their kids sometimes, you know, that's how much more dangerous really can you get? You know, you're talking about these people's most uh, valued, possessions sort of it's their children that we're talking about so um you know it's it's just at the end of the day i sleep fairly well knowing that you know the kids on my caseload are you know taken care of and they're safe and um you know that i have done everything i can to to make sure of that so awesome thank you so much jess so let's just dive into it why don't you chat with us about um what how do you how you prepare to take a case so we never know what case we're gonna get next um, until it's assigned. It, it could be a custody case. It could be an intact family. Um, our supervisors generally use a rotation. Um, so they keep all their workers' names on a list and they'll just go, you know, go through that list and whoever's up next is the one who gets, you know, whatever case is coming through. Obviously there's different levels of, of workers, you know, so brand new workers most likely would not get a very difficult case Although some of the cases that come in and don't look so difficult can really blow up quick and, and turn into a very difficult case. Um, you know, you know when you're up next for the case, but like I said, you don't know um, what that case will be, what kind of issues there are with the families, what concerns are going to be involved. Once a case is assigned to me, I generally go back in and I review the investigation notes. Particularly, they do an investigation risk assessment, um, and that gives lots of information as to why the case was called in, what priority it was. Um, it summarizes the contacts and any collaterals that the investigation worker made. Um, and it, you know, it gives you really the bottom line as to what the main concerns were with the family, why it's being transferred to treatment, you know, why it couldn't be closed with investigation, why they need ongoing services and things like that. Obviously, if the, if the children are already in care, that's why it was transferred to treatment. Um, but there are cases that come through as intact families, um, you know, where treatment workers are tasked with providing services to the family um, and really just monitoring and making sure that they're following through with what they need to do um, so that we don't have to remove the children from the home. Um, so in the investigation risk assessment, the housing, you know, there's a description of the housing, the conditions of the housing, which medical providers the kids are um, involved with, if, if there's any medical conditions, what school they go to, um, if the family's already involved with services, what providers they go to. Um, uh, there's little tidbits of, you know, their DFS history in there. 
And then we can also re um, review their initial interview notes. Um, and that's where they made the first contact with the family. So they're going out and they're talking with them about, you know, why the case was called in and, and you know, they're gathering a lot of information that way. When you're looking through all this past information, it's easy to notice the patterns. So if they were, you know, scheduling appointments with the investigation worker, but not keeping them, um, or if they were missing appointments with doctors, or if the kids weren't going to school, you can tell a lot about their, their attitudes and their dispositions. So how is this family going to interact with me? Um, you know, like I said earlier, treatment is a lot different, we have to build a rapport because we have to work with the families long term. Um, so it's, it's really important for us to go in very non judgmental, um, you know, very really down to earth and just because if we don't build that rapport, it's going to be like almost an automatic failure with this family. Um, you, you can't you really can't get far um, without that. So we have, once a case has been assigned to us, we have 10 days to make an initial contact with the family. <clears throat> what I, I set up a folder. I got my pretty little folders that I take with me. Um, I'll make a face sheet that will have um, the addresses, phone numbers, dates of birth, um, any information I need that I may need quick to have on hand quickly. So if I'm contacting a provider to, to get information, I need to be able to tell them the name, the date of birth, um, you know, verify that information. Um, I'll print relevant and any other relevant information. So I might print the investigation risk assessment to take with me on that first contact. So I can sort of go through it, um, you know, as I'm gathering that first initial information from the family. If there's a safety plan in place, I'll print that out so that I'll have that on hand. Um, I go through and check consents and make sure that any consent I might need is in the file, that it's up to date. Um, I also go through and I'll run a quick criminal history check on the family. Um, and this really, I do that more so I can see their picture, so I can see what they look like, um, you know, because I don't want to walk into a home and somebody say they're somebody that they're not or, um, you know, things like that. Sometimes I'll go through and, and do a quick check on DFS history, um, but I try not to do that until later on in the case, like when I'm preparing, starting to prepare the case plans or do our assessments, um, just because I'm like I said, I'm, I'm still trying to stay non-judgmental, so I don't want to be too clouded by what this family has been through before or, you know, things like, I want them to tell me why they're, you know, when I first go meet them, I introduce myself and I tell them, you know, why, why did you, why do you think your case came into DFS? Um, you know, so I want to really get them vocalizing and, and recognizing their issues. Um, so, like I said, when I make the initial, I introduce myself, I explain the treatment unit, um, you know, what we do, review why the case came in, often from the client's perspective. I go over treatment services and what the families can expect moving forward. So, from the investigation risk assessment, I can tell what the family is going to need. If it's going to be substance use services or mental health or pay, if there's parenting issues, if they need help finding a job, if their housing is not appropriate or they might be homeless, you know, um, I can usually tell what they'll need. And I'll a little bit, you know, I'll just start touching on some of those services at the initial meeting so that they know what to look, you know, what they have to look forward to. Um, I also go through and explain to them what's needed for the case to be closed successfully. Some of our cases aren't closed successfully. Um, you know, if they're not completing elements of their case plan, if they're not, um, you know, compliant in services, we don't have to stay open with families just because um, they're not being compliant. And that's mostly for intact families. Um, you know, so we, we do have the opportunity or the whatever to to close a case unsuccessfully as long as the children are safe and you know there's no imminent risks to them so once we start you know going through the first contacts with the family we have a lot of stuff that gets work listed for us to do a, a lot of different assessments so we have a child strength and needs assessment that we start with and that outlines the physical or medical needs of the child, which would include, you know, well child checks, immunizations, is all that up to date? Who's their providers? Um, and then there's an educational piece. Are they attending school? What grade are they in? What's their grades look like? Um, do they have an IEP in place? Do they need an IEP in place? You know, there's, there's lots of different, uh, lots of different pieces to that. 
Then there's a developmental element, um, and that would be more so as the child, you know, meeting developmental milestones. If if they're under three, do they need to be referred for child development watch? Um, you know, is there any any concerns that you know could be addressed through child development watch or or a medical provider? What's their social relationships look like? So are they you know are they having issues with peers in school? Um, or, or do they not have any social relationships or, you know, what, what kind of activities or services can we put in, you know, to sort of get that kicked up for, for some of these kids. And then emotional behavioral health, are there, are there issues with that? Do they need counseling? Are they already in counseling? Um, you know, there's, there's just, it's a, it's really a lot. Family relationships, you know, there's, there's certain types of therapeutic services we can put in that's geared more towards family counseling and, you know, and relationships. Um, substance use, that's on the child strength and needs as well. Um, most of the time we don't, you know, that's not something that we have to worry about. But again, you know, we have come across some children, specifically teens, who have experimented or are using, you know, substances. And, and if that's the case, we definitely want, you know, some kind of services in geared to address that issue. Once the child strength and needs assessment is done, then we have to do a family strength and needs assessment. And a lot of the same elements that are on the child's is on the family one as well, but that one's geared more towards the parents. So medical, mental health, um, any cognitive issues, substance use issues, any legal issues, uh, parenting behaviors and routines, basic needs and management of financial resources, which that element would include employment and housing. Um, how about their community environment and neighborhood? So where are they living? Is it a good neighborhood? Is there concerns? You know, can the kids play outside without having, you know, eye of sight supervision, you know, that those types of things. Is there domestic violence? How is the parents getting along with other household or family members? Um, and do the parents have a social support system? You know, they need that as well. Once those are done, then we have to submit them for approval so our supervisors approve them and it works lists us the family service plan anything on the csng or the fsng that is scored at a three or a four automatically gets pulled over to the family service plan so that's what the parents need services for um, and to go back and clarify so you score them between one and four um, one is really no concerns at all you know there, there might be a little something there but the family's taking care of it and it works its way up to a four would be the most serious concern um, and if it's if somebody scores a four then you know most likely you need a safety plan in place or you know something like that um, so the family service plan you know, once that's completed, that would that would include all the elements that there were concerns with. So, you know, we might refer for a parenting class or functional family therapy. Um, you know, we might put on there that the parents need employment and they need to provide verification of employment. Um, they may need, you know, more appropriate housing. They may be on probation um, or have pending charges or warrants or, you know, things like that. Um, if if they have a substance use issue, you know, we want definitely want that on the case plan that they need to, you know, engage in services or, or stay in the services that they're in, that they need to attend all sessions, they need to be compliant, they need to be submitting clean drug screens, um, you know, and that they need to be following the recommendations of that service provider. So these are all things that we also have to check up on every so often throughout the case to make sure that the parents are following through with, you know, what those recommendations are and that they're being compliant with their services. And I usually try to check in with, with the providers once a month, usually right before I make a contact with the family, because we, we have to make monthly contacts. Um, just so that when I go out there, again, I'm gathering information from the family, but I have the facts also from the providers. So, you know, a lot of times the parents are going to downplay their issues. They're going to say, oh, we've been clean for two months now. Um, you know, but what they don't know at first anyway, you know, obviously they do catch on after a while that Jess has already figured this out. Um, but, you know, they might say, I've been clean for two months, but I have their drug screens that say, you know, they just used last week. So, you know, you can call them out on that. I keep it very real with my clients. I don't sugarcoat things. I don't, um, and I, I'll tell them that, right, you know, almost at our initial meeting, you know, that I'm going to tell them like it is, 
that, you know, they need to stay honest with me, I'll stay honest with them. Um, you know, that that's really the only way that we're going to be able to work through this and, and have a, su a successful completion. So then the family service plan is reviewed every three months, um, formally in focus in our computer system. Um, and that's where you basically just, you know, punch in an update if they've achieved that goal, if they haven't achieved it. Um, other assessments that come up sometimes are a caregiver safety assessment. Um, we generally do these different assessments every 90 days or so. Um, there's a risk reassessment and there's a reunification reassessment if the child is in care. Um, and like I said, we just, we do those and it, it just gives us back numbers that say, you know, what the risk is, if the case should remain open or if, you know, we may look, be able to look at possibly closing the case. Um, the caregiver safety will generate the safety plan if you need a safety plan. So depending on what scores are on the caregiver safety, um, you may need to, you know, as, as treatment workers, we may need to put a safety plan in. And then if the child is in care or if a child comes into care, there's, there's plans that we have to do for that child. So there's a five day plan that we have to complete within five days of a new placement. Um, and then within 30 days of the child, of the five day plan being completed, we have to do a child plan. Um, and that gives a lot more detailed information about the needs of the child. And then every six months after the initial child plan is completed, we do child plan reviews. Um, we generally get parent input, you know, biological parent input on these child plans, foster parent input on the child plans. Um, and we, you know, we get their signatures once they're done, um, you know, and, and provide copies to everybody just so that they know, you know, the parents are, are informed of what's going on with their kids too. So that's basically what happens when a case first comes in. It's a lot. <laughs> that is a lot. Can we pause real quick for some questions? So we do have one question in the chat. If there is a cheat sheet for DFS workers to stream um, in which, so for example, like which worker does what and at what point in the case, as well as a timeline for how long workers have to meet with the family or make a determination. So there's not really, I, I have made myself a little cheat sheet, um, you know, as far as what, like, like, so when a case gets transferred to treatment, we always, it's always 10 days to make that initial contact. Um, and, and once it's in treatment, it's our case, like there's no other worker. Um, so there's no other DFS worker that's sort of helping us, or, I mean, we might have a, our FSA, our, our assistant, you know, that, that may do stuff for us. Um, if we need it, or, or we may, you know, um, have a coworker that might cover, you know, a meeting or something, but, but for the most part, it's all us. Um, the assessments that we do, so the, um, sorry, I just hit this button. Um, the child strengths and needs, the family strengths and needs, those are generally six weeks or do six weeks after we get the case. So it get, does give us that period of time. Um, to really dig in with the family and see what service we, we don't want to overwhelm them with services, but we have to address, you know, really what's going on or we're not doing any justice for the families and the kids. Um, you know, and then the, the family service plan is usually two weeks out from the from the child strengths and needs and the family strengths and needs being completed. So that's that's the general timelines. Um, if it's a court case, then obviously we have different um, timelines to run by because we're, you know, we're being that all that stuff is dictated by the court. Um, you know, so we have the preliminary protective hearing that you go to 30 days from that is the adjudicatory, usually 30 days from the adjudicatory is the dispositional and that's where the case plan is presented to the court. Um, and then every three months after the case plan is presented and accepted, we have the um, review hearings. You generally have three review hearings and then you move into, you know, the permanency hearings after that. So there's, you know, it's sort of concrete timelines, but not so, at the same time, not so much, um, you know, but the quicker you get in and, and really get working with the families, the, the better it will go. Um, so that's, that's usually, like I say, 10 days to make initial contact, six weeks for the assessments that treatment does, two months 
in total from when the case came in or, or about two weeks after the assessments are completed, you have to do the case plan. Gotcha. And we have a follow-up question. I'll just clarify that um, the question is that CASAs do not get involved in cases where Division of Family Services has taken custody. So that is true. We CASA volunteers only get involved where DFS has taken custody and there are court proceedings. We used to way back when, when we had, I think we just had a lesser caseload and more CASAs. We used to do some private cases, but for the last couple of years, CASAs just are appointed to cases where Division of Family Services has taken custody and we have all those court hearings. Um, so and, uh, uh, does, if anybody has questions, you can feel free to just come on off mute and just ask your question. Uh, Ms. Janice, go for it. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm making sure because I, I heard her say something. Sometimes cases don't end well or what happens after that? And then she trying to clarify the next question or the first question I was really going to ask in reference to where the courts were involved. So that's not an issue. I understand that part. But when you've got a case playing with um, a family and they're not compliant, they're not doing what, you know, like you said, some of them just, they just don't. So what happens there? What, what, what do you, is there a follow up that goes with that? You know, because it didn't so, go well. Right. So most of the time, if, if we're closing a case unsuccessfully, um, it's only really because they haven't um, done something minor, you know, like maybe they didn't complete the parenting class and or maybe they didn't, you know, maybe they weren't the most compliant with functional family therapy. If, if there's a major concern like substance use or mental health issues or domestic violence or, you know, those I consider those the more major issues, um, and I would never close a case with current with with a child in that home still and those current concerns going on. So we we would either safety plan the child out of the home, um, you know, with appropriate relative caregivers or something of that nature, or or maybe we would encourage them to file for guardianship of this child. Um, you know, so there's always uh, there's always something that can be done, and and we really would not you know close a case. I have one now that I'm actually working on closing. Um, the mother is very you know very involved in substance use. She's not engaged in any services. Her child is with her sister. Um, the sister hasn't filed for guardianship yet, but you know, this mom is not being compliant with me. She's not maintaining contact. So I can't get services in for her. You know, she's been referred to our, um, our substance use liaison. Um, she, you know, that liaison has not been able to contact her. She's, she's homeless, you know, so she's sort of just bouncing around from place to place. So, but my inability to maintain contact with her, and I've had this conversation with her, you know, I've told her, if you want these services, you know, so that, so that your child can come back and live with you, then you've got to maintain contact with me. And she just hasn't done that. But because the child is safe with the aunt, you know, the aunt knows the concerns that we have. Um, you know, we have no concerns with the child being with the aunt. So that, that gives me the ability to close the case and it would be closed unsuccessfully because mom didn't, you know, she wasn't compliant. So, so would you, so would you be recommending to the aunt to go for guardianship because it's done I'm, I'm, just what just I'm just trying to hypothetically see what you're saying the mothers who knows where how long she'll be out there you know what I mean so are y'all right. encouraging the aunt to file for guardianship or is the court kicking in here or, or how does what goes I mean this is a good little case you just said I mean because that's just some of the things that I was like okay okay there's got to be these cases out there I know they are so what right. happens with, with that so yes, I have encouraged this aunt to file for guardianship. Um, and prior to the case being closed, I will also provide her with a letter of support from the division. So it will outline what our concerns are and that the division supports her petition for guardianship. So she and you know, the instructions with that letter will be to, for her to include that with her petition if and when she files. Um, I explained to her the importance of her filing for guardianship. Um, you know, she's, she's not had any issues so far, but, you know, she can't make medical decisions without guardianship. She can't make educational decisions without guardianship. And she, like I said, she's been lucky so far in being able to maintain contact with mom, you know, so that mom can consent for these different things that may happen or, you know, may come up. And, you know, worst case scenario, what if something happens with the kid? He's got to go to the hospital. He needs, you know, he needs some kind of surgery. Well, the aunt won't be able to consent to that because she doesn't have guardianship. And if she's not able to 
contact mom, there's your problem. Um, you know, unfortunately, there's only so much we can do with that. And it would, you know, if it came to that, then the case would probably end up coming through DFS again. Um, you know, where, where either the aunt would be, you know, I don't want to say forced to file for guardianship, but she would, you know, she, she would basically be given an ultimatum. Either you're going to file at this point or the division is going to have to take custody. Um, you know, but right now it's, it's okay because, you know, we've, we've, we've not had that issue come up, but like I said, I've had lots of conversations with the aunt and I think she, she doesn't want to file right now because she has, she's still holding on to the hope that her sister is going to, you know, get it together and be able to take her child back. And I get that, you know, I, I understand that. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it's going to be really important for her in particular to realize that, you know, some tough love would come in handy here. Yeah, and I wonder if once paperwork is filed, then just the relationships kind of change a little bit between family members. Right. Yep, exactly. Yeah, good question. So, and Jessica, that was really helpful and to it for you explaining kind of what happens before, you know, be behind the scenes, kind of before the courts get involved, because there's a whole lot, you know, that CASAs don't see because we're not appointed at that time. So then for any CASA that receives a case, so say we'll take that same case with this young boy and the aunt, say she doesn't take guardianship and then there's a, a reason that a decision needs to be made and mom is gone, DFS would then take custody, possibly, then CASA would get involved. Part of the CASA's initial record, you know, reading of records would be all of this information that you're talking about and all the attempts that you've made, Jessica, in trying to work with the family. So when CASA, a CASA might take that case, we have, you know, a chunk of background information. Cool. Jessica, I have a question for you. Um, when you mm -hmm. said, when you start working with a family um, and they and they are not particularly receptive to your assistance what are some of the tactics and techniques that you employ to try to establish the relationship and, and try to encourage them to work with you so i try to use um like prior experiences or, or give them um some examples of prior cases who maybe have given me the same kickback on things but you know it ended up being i mean i've had families like i am not doing this parenting class that is so stupid that is you know blah 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 but by the time they're done that parenting class they're like thank you so much that was very informative you know so i try to give those examples to the families i'm working with and i also go in and approach them with that it's really not a choice. You know, this is what you have to do. Um, you know, and, and that's a whole part of the kind of putting your foot down, um, you know, with them that, you know, this is this is how it it's gonna go. Now, obviously I can't, you know, if I don't have custody of their kids, I don't have much teeth, but, um, you know, in the long run, but it works that way sometimes too. You know, like these are the services that's on your case plan. This is what you have to do in order for your case to be successfully closed. And I go on to explain a little bit, you know, if your case is unsuccessfully closed and, and this may, you know, Ms. Janice come back to you and, and, but it comes back through DFS in two or three months because things just weren't working out, then they're gonna see this unsuccessful closure and it's gonna give that worker you know, more to go on, um, more grounds to, you know, to, to really, forced you into compliance. You have a question. Go ahead. I see you raising your hand. <laughs> um, th this, okay, hypothetically, here the person, here the, here the family comes back in the system. Now, do you say, okay, we're going to start this whole therapy, I mean, this whole program again and see if you're able to do, the, do what you're supposed to be, be compliant, or are, are there other drastic Okay, now this is where we are. So we're here instead of there. Because it may be a point where it might be court involved. I mean, I'm just saying, I don't know what a scenario would be, but are they given that second chance to just to oh, be compliant all over again and do what they're supposed to, you know, or what? Yeah, so it's going to depend on why it came in, um, you know, and, and what the severity of the, of the issues or the concerns were. Um, 
you know, if, if this case, this example that I've used in particular, so so if it came back in again because something happened with the child um, and, and the aunt didn't have guardianship and mom wasn't available, then that would be, you know, where we would say, you're either going to file for guardianship right now, you know, we're going to go to the courthouse right now, or DFS is going to file a petition for custody. Um, but there, you got to remember that we have to have grounds, you know, and those grounds are fairly difficult sometimes, um, you know, to meet with the court for us to be able to get custody of kids. I mean, there's a, um, it's hard sometimes, you know, it's, I mean, I've had, I had a case, the family was living in a motel for Lauren, you're probably familiar with this one for like three months, you know, um, and, and they were just barely getting by, you know, one of the kids wasn't attending school. That's not a DFS issue. You know, that's a truancy. That's a school issue. Um, you know, so, and it took probably three months before I was able to file for custody of those kids. And before I had enough to, you know, go in with that petition and say, you know, I need, I need custody of these kids. Yeah, interesting. Okay. Awesome. Any other questions before Jess moves on? Yeah, go ahead, Joyce. Yes, yeah, you mentioned earlier that once it comes from the, I guess, the investigation risks, I mean, they do their assessment, then you said that it, once you guys get it and make a determination, it goes back to someone else to do the reviews? We do those reviews. So we, we do the reviews um, every, you know, as when a family service plan is made and presented to the family, then at three months after that is when we start, you know, the review process with the formal reviews in our computer system. But I thought that you meant not the reviews with the court or reviews within your agency, because you said something about making a determination to, maybe it's a determination to go forward with treatment. And then you said we submit it to someone else, they do the reviews and I wasn't sure in terms of interagency, you, your agency is doing the review or the making the determination for it to go forward as a case after the assessment risk, the risk assessment? Okay, so the, once the investigation worker completes their investigation risk assessment, um, that assessment determines whether the family needs ongoing services in which the case would be transferred to treatment or if not, then the investigation worker can close the case at that point, and it's just closed. So it doesn't get, you know, at that point, it would not get transferred to treatment at all. Um, I, like I said, obviously, if there's children in care, then it automatic is that's an automatic. It's coming to treatment. Um, but the assessments that we do as treatment workers. Like we would do the child's strengths and needs, the family strengths and needs, you know, maybe a caregiver safety, um, risk reassessments, you know, those are all assessments that we do. They do get submitted to our supervisor for approval. So our supervisor reads through the assessments that we've done and approves them. Um, and then they just, it's like a revolving every 90 days, you know, their work listed as being due again. So. Okay. I hope that helped. <laughs> 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 awesome. All right, Jess, if you kind of want to move on to, I forget what one of my next questions that I gave you was, but <laughs> once you, once you start working, what well, now you're in the case, you've, you've been in for, you know, maybe a couple, you know, maybe we're at the dispositional hearing or something kind of, what do you do from there? So once the family is presented with a case plan, that's when we really start referring for services. So I may make a referral for a parenting class. Um, or functional family therapy. The child may have some issues and we want, you know, maybe the family wants a referral to the Division of Prevention and Behavioral Health for a higher level of, you know, outpatient services. Um, you know, so I may help them with that referral. Um, if they're involved with providers already, that's when we really dig in and start with, you know, consistent contacts with those providers. Are they compliant? Are they attending all their sessions? Are they following all your recommendations? Are they, um, are they providing clean urine screens? Um, you know, we may make a referral for a family interventionist. That's one of our favorite programs. They help so much. Um, you know, we have outside agencies that provide their services and they can really help with the family. So I've had family interventionists that will take families to apply for jobs or they will take them to, you know, look for housing. Um, you know, there's, we have the 
we call them AOD, but they're the substance abuse liaisons. So if a if a family is not engaged in treatment yet, you know, I may make a referral to that liaison to help that person or that parent, you know, find and secure services for that. There's a domestic violence liaison that we can use if we think there's domestic violence issues. Um, and, you know, that liaison can help that parent, you know, find services, their shelters there. I mean, there's tons of resources out there. A lot of these parents just don't know how to, how to grab them. Um, you know, so we really try to, and like I said, without overwhelming them, um, but we really try to get as much in right from the start as we can. Gotcha. So Joyce had a question, or Janice had a question to, if you could, if you could explain the Functional Families Program, what is that? So the Functional Family Therapy Program is offered through Children and Families First, and it's a therapist that goes into the home and meets with the family all together. Um, and there's actually a specific uh, modules that there, so there's a, a specific plan and outline that they follow with the family um, to identify and work through issues um, that that family might be. It may be communication skills, it may be discipline, it may be, you know, um, parenting styles or chores or, you know, like it's just, it, they really dig in with the families and it usually takes about 16 weeks um, and then, you know, at the end of that time, they should have worked through the modules. Um, and, you know, and, and that has really been an effective program in my experience. Does that program focus on age ranges? It does. It's generally for kids, I think it's 12 and up. Um, you know, so it's not, not really geared towards the younger kids, but, you know, 12, 13, 14 years old and, and up is, is the age range that that one focuses on. Okay. Janice, yep, if you wanna unmute yourself, you can ask your question. I don't mean to hog it up, but so this program is basically gated to the children, when you say 12 and up, or is it like, when you said chores and different things, so is it basically to get them involved or get, get their input as children, you said 12 and up, so how the parent, because yes. I, I, I've, I've dealt with family and, and, and children's first, and most of the times it was the parents coming there, have visits and different things like that, weekly visits. But okay, so this is gated. Then they, might, they were much younger children also. But now you said when you said 12 and up, I was trying to, I didn't know who it was geared to. Is it everybody or the children? It's the family as a whole, um, you know, so it may, if, if the parents are having difficulties, you know, getting the kids engaged around the house to take out the trash or, you know, it would give, you know, that functional family therapist would be able to give the parents tools to address that behavior. Um, and at the same time, address the child and, you know, get the child to realize and understand that, you know, this, these are res normal responsibilities, you know, you're not being you know, singled out, you know, and, and black sheep or anything because you have to take the trash out today. Um, you know, so they really just, you know, deal with with basic, you know, family issues and really try to get the family to come together and, and work together as a whole. Yeah. There's other programs geared towards the, I mean, so there's parents as teachers, you know, that's geared towards the younger children. Um, and that's where, you know, obviously with that program, the the teach it's a teacher um, that is working with the parents on addressing behavioral issues appropriately or you know developmental issues um, things like that and that would be for the for the younger the younger kids yeah awesome thank you Jessica what other um, programs when you are working on a treatment plan what other programs do you can you utilize or do you utilize in treatment? So um, we've got functional family therapy, we've got the uh, parenting classes, which are also through children and families first, and there's strengthening families or nurturing parents. Again, that's age dependent. Um, the younger kids and their parents go in through the nurturing parents program and the older ones would go through the strengthening families program. Um, you know, I, I provide my clients with lists. So if they have substance use issues and, and, you know, maybe they're not engaged in any services yet, you know, we've got connections, we've got thresholds, we've got AMS, which is not, you know, my favorite, but it, it is one nonetheless. Um, you know, if there's mental health, you know, I try to give them a list of providers, there's people's place, there's 
focused behavioral health, there's fellowship there, you know, cause they just don't know. Um, you know, so I tried to give them as much information, um, while, while letting them make the decision on who they want their provider to be. Um, you know, we have the family interventionist program. We've got, you know, we generally use wraparound Delaware or new behavioral network, um, for the, you know, for that program, there's home-based mental health support. So, you know, if, if transportation might be an issue or time, you know, a lot of this, some, some families do work, you know, we don't want to take that away from them make, by making them go to counseling sessions, you know, once or twice a week. Um, so there is home-based mental health services, um, also through New Behavioral Network or Wraparound that we can refer to. And, and with those, the, the therapist comes to the home and works with the family instead of the family having to go out um, to the provider. So how do you gauge, um one provider over another for say substance abuse um you know how do you how do you choose well like i said i generally don't make the choice i leave that to the parents um you know i prefer uh, connections is a good one i know they've been having some issues lately with um how they've been running their business but we used to have kent and sussex and they totally just fell off i don't know what happened with them um you know but I, I try to encourage them to go to providers that are going to be beneficial to them, um, you know, while also meeting our needs for being able to obtain records and, you know, uh, being able to gauge how they've been doing. So, like I said, AMS is not my favorite and it's Shelly just asked what is AMS. So it's a it's a substance abuse provider. It, they're in Lewis um, or Rehob the Rehoboth Beach area. Um, but they don't do random, so, so for instance, they don't do random drug screens. So how do I know, you know, if these clients are smart, I mean, they're not, they know how to work the system. You know, they're not gonna go, if they only go to see their provider once a month, they're gonna know that that day they need to be clean, you know, so they need to stop using the day or so before that appointment. Um, you know, so that's, that's why that agency in particular is not really my favorite. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, it's the client's choice as to where they want to go. We don't, we really don't have much teeth as far as, you know, making them choose it because all these services are voluntary. Um, you know, so they, you know, ultimately they have the choice as to whether they want to do it or not. Um, yeah, so I, it's like leading a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Like I can give you, I can provide you with all these services. I'm going to lay them out right in front of you, but it's up, it's ultimately, it's up to you to take them and use them. Gotcha. <clears throat> um, okay, so I think one of my other questions to you uh, was about court. How do you prepare for court hearings? Shoo! <laughs> records, records, and more records. No, um, you know. So I obviously I, I have a template that I use. Um, it's called a trial prep form, and it goes through. You know, and it outlines so each child separately when they've had medical appointments if there's any medical issues when they've had mental health appointments um who their providers are when was their last appointments when when is their next appointments um you know the same with dental vision these are all things that especially down here in sussex county the judges want to know so there's a lot of difference between the three counties lauren and i were actually talking about this earlier um, Sussex County judges want so much more information, in my experience, than Kent or Newcastle. Um, you know, they just, they like the paperwork, um, they like the information, they like the detailed orders that they're able to put out. Um, you know, so I try to have as much information for them and there's never, without a doubt, there's always one question that I don't have the answer for and it drives me nuts every time, um, you know, but, it, it, we spend a lot of time preparing for court and just making sure that all of our ducks are in a row. You know, we outline the parents, their, their case plan, what have they done, what haven't they done, what do they still need to do. Um, you know, I have to make sure that my attorneys have witness lists, they have to send out the subpoenas, you know, to, to these witnesses that, that we need to come in and, and testify to how the parents have done or, or how they haven't done, um, you know, certain things. So there's, really a lot that that starts right after the court hearing is over you start preparing for the next one um you know with with gathering records and, and as much information as you can oh, cool awesome i forget all my other questions that i had emailed you oh joyce how about joyce you can ask your question 
Yeah, in terms of records and, and getting uh, access to those, what are uh, CASAs allowed to get record, uh, allowed to get access to? It's my understanding that you guys can get access to everything with that court order that's appointed you as a CASA. Yep, you can get um, information on the children, on the parents, on the, I think you just need to give, you just need to supply that, that order, you know, that, that shows that you have been appointed for CASA on a case. Um, and you should be able to have access to those records. Well, like if you contact me with someone to, with, with, that has the FI, we can't solicit records from the FI. Those records go to DFS and then we have to ask you for- No, you can absolutely get records from that FI. Yep, oh, you I, can absolutely. Oh, okay, because I've made requests and they said, oh, I'll stop. Well, maybe it's the visit, the parent visits and the birth visits and those things that maybe they are preparing their report for that gets sent to DFS and then we can get it from DFS because I've requested and they've said, mm -hmm. oh, you can't get it. You, you have to go through uh, the, the DFS worker. Yeah, yeah, that doesn't sound, that shouldn't be the case at all. No, um, I don't Joyce, know what agency you're working with, but yeah, that's not, no, no. They should give you everything. Yeah, Joyce, I would ask that you contact that you work with your CASA coordinator to get those records. So the general rule is that order of appointment. Um, if somebody's name is on it, you can get records for them. So that would be parent, uh, might be both parents, it might be um, a parent or a previous guardian, um, or and the child. So if their name is on that order, you can get the, the records without asking anybody anything. The only time I've had a couple of cases where CASAs wanted records for somebody that was not on that order would be if it was a, a parental paramour, like a boyfriend or girlfriend, um, and they are living with the, the parent and they were probably going to be act as a step parent and we wanted some information on them. If that's the case, we would have that, that particular person sign a release so that we could get those particular records. But your order of appointment will give you, that's like your golden ticket <laughs> to get records for any of those parents and or children. Okay, and maybe what I was also talking about, release of records, like the, you said you get a, a signed consent from the parent to have a release of maybe um, their, their urine screens or something from Savita. Yeah, and each, each each organization kind of does things a little bit differently. I know with Connections, we used to be able to just send our uh, order of appointment, and then they asked us to also have parents sign a release, so then we were having parents sign a release, and now I think they're doing something different, so I'm not quite sure, but each organization kind of works a little bit differently. But yeah, Joyce, we should be able to get records. Um, so just work with your coordinator, depending on which records you're asking for. Okay. And maybe even talk to the DFS worker, um, you know, and have it, sometimes if the DFS worker can send an email to the agency and say, hey, you know, it's okay to send records to, you know, Miss Joyce, you know, go ahead and send them over. Sometimes that works too. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, Leanne, did you have a question? No, I was just going to say, I've also had to have, even though like mom is on the order, I've had to have her sign something for like mental health or like to get all those medical records um, before. So I don't know if that's what Joyce was talking about. It, it might be dependent on that particular agency, but an FI, a family interventionist, should easily be able to share information. Um, a lot of times CASAs have asked family interventionists, hey, when you send your court prep documentation to DFS, can you also send it to me? Um, you know, that's usually worked pretty well in the past because most family interventionists have a court preparation form, kind of like what Jess was talking about for herself, um, you know, that, that lists the dates of visits, if they were attended, if they were missed, if they were missed, why, if they were held, where were they held, for how long, who was there, things like that. Awesome. All right, Jess. Um, <laughs> what other questions did I ask you? Um, <laughs> There's one on here about TDMs. Yeah, actually, that's a good. So can you talk about team decision-making meetings, TDMs? So, yep. So a team decision-making meeting generally occurs prior to a child um, coming into DFS custody. In an ideal world, that's when we want the TDM to occur. Um, and we request those TDMs when there are significant concerns that the family's not addressing the way we need them to address. 
Um, I'm gonna give you another example. I have a case right now. I have a family, three children, um, mother and father. They are currently living in a motel, so I'm watching that very closely, um, but they specifically have one child um, who has some significant medical issues that they're not following through to the um, medical providers liking. Um, you know, and, and, and that's, a, that's a slippery slope as well because, you know, we can't necessarily take custody of a child because the parents aren't following, you know, the medical recommendations unless we have a medical provider that's willing to come into court and testify as to what those specific, you know, and really stick, stick by it. Um, you know, so I've, I've been on this family a lot um, recently about, you know, making sure that you're following the recommendations and that you're, you know, that you're doing everything that, that you need to do um, for these medical providers. Um, so I'm possibly looking at requesting a TDM for this family just to, and, and again, it could, it could give me a little more teeth and let the family know that I'm not playing around here. You know, you know, we've had this conversation on several occasions about how you need to be doing this, this, and this, yet you're not doing it yet. So now we're gonna, now we're gonna take the next step and we're gonna have a TDM. Um, so at that TDM, um, we have a facilitator slash mediator. Um, and once I send the referral in, again, I send it to my supervisor, my supervisor approves it and it's automatically work listed to the facilitators. Um, the facilitator will reach out to the parents and say, you know, your worker has requested a TDM, who would you like to attend? Um, and the facilitator will try to solicit as much information on you know, other relative caregivers or friends that may be appropriate or, you know, things like that, that we want to have at this meeting because at the end of the TDM, there has to be a plan in place. So if the parents cannot come up with a suitable plan, then the division is going to take custody. That's the only two outcomes of a TDM. Um, you know, once we've, once we've gotten to that point, that's where we, you know, that's where we have to go. Um, so obviously the DFS caseworker and that caseworker supervisor attends the TDM and then we have the facilitator, <clears throat> the parents and any family members that they have chosen to invite. So we're not allowed to invite people, the, the parents have to invite the people that they want to attend this meeting. Um, and like I said, the, the purpose, the main purpose is to find and secure an appropriate resource or a plan so that the children don't have to end up in, you know, don't have to come into DFS custody, but if that cannot be made, um, then the worker would petition for custody. Gotcha. All right, Miss Joyce, you have a question. Go for it. Miss Janice, I think. Oh, sorry, Janice. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> now, at that point, Acosta, at that point, Acosta is not involved yet because um, that's a hearing that, that, that they're doing to try to resolve either either or. So the cost is not involved at that point yet, correct? Correct, right, okay. yep. Okay. yep. But one thing that's really helpful is the Division of Family Services worker, whoever is involved with that TDM, usually takes notes or there's some documentation about it. So when you, if and when you do, that case does come into DFS custody and starts with the court process, CASA volunteers will be able to read kind of what happened at that TDM just to get an idea of kind of what the kind of the two, you know, the alternative to taking custody, what was the other, you know, what were, what was discussed. Um, so if there's any other family members or, or family resources, um, you know, that might be helpful to know. And there's actually, you know, so the, the DFS worker would take notes and put a note in our system, but there's also the TDM facilitator also does a like a formal report at the end and will outline, you know, everything that was discussed, what, you know, and what the plan was that we came up with. Um, now, there are some occasions when there may be a CASA appointed, um, you know, you know, prior to the TDM and if like if we had to take emergency custody of a child and we didn't have time to do the TDM, you know, then then there's a chance that a CASA would already be appointed prior to that TDM being scheduled. Um, but we generally have like one or two weeks, there's a small window of time where we have to have a TDM after we've taken custody of a child if, if we're not able to have that meeting prior to taking custody. Gotcha. This is a statistic question, so I don't know if you know this answer off the top of your head, but thinking about the cases that you've worked in general, um, 
what percentage of cases that involve a TDM do not end up going forward to a court in, with court involvement? I would say in, in my experience with my past cases, I've only had one or two that have not resulted in custody. Um, you know, so yeah, yep. Um, you know, most of the time when, when I'm requesting a TDM, it's pretty bad. Like it's, you know, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's to the point where, you know, I've tried everything at, you know, and I've not gotten anywhere yet with these parents. So now we really need to sit them down and they're either going to step up or, or we're going to really step in, you know? So, um, I would say probably only one or two families have been able to come up with a solid plan, um, that has lasted, you know, um, the, the case I referred to earlier with the kids with the, you know, the, they were in a motel for three months and, you know, things like that. Um, we had a TDM on that case and, you know, then we go three months later, I was taking custody of the kids because they had, they came up with a plan, but then they weren't able to follow through with it. Um, you know, so. Yeah. What, another statistic question, but what percentage in your experience of your cases that you have a TDM, you come up with a plan and then a little bit of time lapses, and then you, you then it, it, the plan doesn't work. Probably uh, for that one, probably about half and half. Um, you know, so sometimes the plans go great, and and sometimes they, you know, sometimes they just completely fall apart. The parents aren't able to hold it together. Um, you know, maybe maybe someone that they identified, you know, that attended this meeting was able to. Um, you know, sign a safety plan or, or be a care, you know, a supervisor or a caregiver for, for a period of time. Um, maybe they're no longer able to do that. You know, maybe they're like, hey, this is it. You know, this is too much for me. Um, but once we've had the TDM, we don't have to have another one. Um, you know, so all of that is already included in the initial TDM that was held, you know, and um, and once once we've had that that one TDM, even if that plan falls apart, you know, it's 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 on there, and and the participants know that if this plan falls apart, DFS is going to take custody. Exactly. <clears throat> okay. Any other questions on team decision making meetings before we move on? <laughs> awesome. Um, Jess, were any, was any of my other questions about working a case? Um, I know there's uh, biggest barriers when working with a family for reunification. Yeah, okay, so yeah, mm -hmm. what, what are some of the barriers? And then I'll ask a CASA specific <sighs> question, but um, and, and when, you're, when you're working with a family and, and working on a reunification case plan, what are some of your barriers? So the, the single most biggest barrier is housing. Mm -hmm. um, housing, it's, it is almost practically impossible um, to get some of these families into safe and stable and appropriate housing. Um, you know, we, we have a couple programs that we have the SRAP voucher, um, we have the family F FUP, family unification program, um, but the wait lists for these are horrendous, you know, um, and they just, especially down here in Sussex County, they can't afford it. Um, housing, the cost of rent somewhere down here is through the, I don't know that I would be able to afford it, you know, a rent payment um, as, a, as a DFS, you know, as a, as a state worker, I just don't know that. So it's, you know, that's the biggest, the biggest barrier. Um, and then you've got, you know, substance use and the family's ability to maintain their sobriety. You know, relapse is, is big. It's, um, it's a big issue and it's something, you know, once, once an abuser, you know, once a, a, I guess a substance abuser or an alcoholic or whatever, you always are gonna be one, um, you know, but your, you know, the plan or the, um, the hope is that they will always stay in recovery. Um, and then you've got mental health, you know, it's, it's hard to tell a person that, you know, I think you have mental health issues that just doesn't come across right when you say that to them. Um, you know, there, there's a huge stigma attached to mental health, but at the end of the day, you know, mental health is, is very often co-occurring with substance use. You've, if you've got a substance abuse issue, you've got some kind of mental health issue going on too, or, or vice, you know, vice versa. A lot of people with mental health issues are, um, self-medicating with with substances um, you know so there's most of the time that's those two are always hand in hand some kind of substance abuse and mental health and that kind of stuff takes time you know you can't just go to substance abuse treatment for two months and you're good to go like no it takes you know and, and especially when a child is in care and we're going through the court 
procedures and stuff. I try to tell the parents, like, we need six months at least of clean screens to see that you're consistently, um, you know, providing those clean screens and, and that you're remaining sober. Yeah, Ms. Janice, go for it. Okay, follow up. Just, just like what she said and say that the, the participant or the parents are compliant. What is the timeline where everything's been adjudicated and does this, is DFS still there afterwards following up or has hands on in some capacity, maybe not as frequent, but just to make sure that things are still where they should be. And I might so be when, asking something where they're discharged out of it. I mean, is it once they're discharged, they're done. I mean, they successfully or whatever. Is there anybody that says, okay, well, let's just check in on so and so. It could be months from now or a year from. You know, how is that doing? Does that does that happen? So if it's a court, so if it's a child in care, when we return that child to the home with their parents, um, I, well, I generally try to stay involved for at least three months just to make sure that everything's running smoothly. I want the transition to be as successful as possible. Um, you know, some some workers might not do that. I, I also, when I'm closing a case, I tell the parents, if you need anything, if you have questions, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I, I may not be your worker anymore. Your case might be closed, um, you know, but I can still point you in the right direction as of, of to what you may need or what you may be looking for, you know, um, instead of just letting everything fall apart, reach out to me. And I've had families do that. Um, you know, I've had parents reach out to me and say, hey, you know, I've got this going on. What can I do? Um, you know, and I'll, I'll text them back real quick and say, you know, try this service or try that service or, um, you know, things like that. So if, if it's an intact family case, though, once we close, we, we're closed. Um, you know, we really don't have any more involvement with, with the family unless, like I said, unless they reach out to us with, with something, um, you know, with some kind of question or concern. Yeah, good question. Um, in term, yeah, and it just, I'm just thinking about these barriers, housing, you know, substance abuse, mental health, even domestic violence mm -hmm. uh, and parenting. I mean, you said that's 16 weeks. All of these elements that are on a case plan are not done overnight. Um, you know, so a lot of these, these elements by nature just take a decent period of time. Um, and you just kind of have to let that time occur to have, you know, to have these, to be able to success, you know, check off and say, yes, this is completed. This is successful. Right. And that's, you know, earlier when I said treatment workers are engaged with these families for a long time, that's why it's important for us to build a rapport from the get go. You know, I don't want to walk into, um, this is a big fight that we've had with administration about our dress code. You know, they want us dressed professional attire all the time, except for Fridays, we can wear jeans. And we fought that, you know, us workers, we fought like, what would I look like walking into a parent's home with something I would go into court with, you know, like that's, they're going to take one look at me and be like, she thinks she's way up here and she thinks we're way down here, you know? So it's, um, it, you know, it's not, I'm not saying I go in there dressed like a bum either, you know, you know what I mean? But um, it's, it's important how you present yourself to the families is, is very important. Um, you know, and to, I mean, the biggest thing is non-judgmental, you know, we've got to go in with, with open eyes and open ears and, and let them know that, you know, a lot of us workers have been somewhat in your situation before. I mean, we're not perfect. Our life has not been unicorns and rainbows either. You know, we know where you, where you're coming from and, and what you're dealing with and, um, you know, let us help you, you know, work, work through this. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about visitation. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Joyce. I just want to make a comment. Um, when Jessica said that housing is one of the single most um, important barriers to getting for reunification and then all the others are substance, abuse, substance use and mental health. And I find also that, um, just getting the parents to understand just what reunification means and in terms of the, 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 the length of time it takes to, like you said, Jessica, to the process to even doing these things. And I just found out that um, even them just having the understanding of the concept of 
what it takes to get to reunification is a barrier also because they're like thinking this is going to happen so fast if they do this it's going to happen but then you also said that sometimes we put in place the in the case plan that it's going to take 90 90 days for you to be clean you know urine clean urine screens and that just concept to them is just like so far out you know in terms of the longevity and that this not just going to take a day or two or a week or two but to be a year of this whole process right and that's that's one of the big things that i try to you know work into my initial contacts with the families especially if the child is in care is like you know, I, I know this is not an ideal situation for you right now. You know, your kids have been removed from your care, but use this time where you don't necessarily have to worry about them to get a second job, get a third job, you know, to, to do all this stuff while you don't have to worry about, well, what am I going to do with my kids while I'm, while I'm doing this? You know, um, you know, I try to reassure them that, you know, our foster homes are, they're not as bad as they're sometimes portrayed in the movies or on TV, you know, they're, um, you know, and I check in with my foster parents all the time. You know, it's like, I'm, I'm constantly making sure that my kiddos are okay. And if I'm, I'm very vocal. So if I have a concern, everybody's going to know about it. Um, um, you know, it's, you know, so I try to try to abate their fears and their, you know, stuff about, oh my God, my kids aren't with me right now. And, and, and try to reverse that and encourage them to, to really hurry up, you know, and dig in. Cause it's, it's only going to go as fast as you make it go. You know, you're the one that's in control of, of, of how fast this process goes. Yeah. Good point. Thinking about foster parents, what are some of the actions you take to, um, kind of connect foster parents to biological parents, if at all, like what is the, how do you manage the relationship kind of between two different parenting entities? So I always try to encourage open communication between foster families and, and biological families, whether it's through a journal that goes back and forth to visits, you know, so we may have a foster mom that writes you know, writes a note in a journal about how their, how the child has done that week. And then that journal goes to the visit the parents are able to read it and the parents can write back to the foster families. That's probably the most um, non-invasive, you know, kind of, kind of contact because, I mean, foster parents are, are leery, you know, with, with, you know, understandably, um, you know, with what they're, you know, the, some of the parents that they're, that they've got their kids. Um, you know, sometimes the foster parents will share phone numbers, you know, and they'll, and the, and the kids can talk to their parents outside of the, of the structured visits that are already scheduled. Um, email addresses are another good one. You know, they can email back and forth about, you know, things that are going on. And, and sometimes the foster parents will bring the kids to the visits. Um, you know, they'll, they'll, you know, they'll bring them, they'll sit and talk for a while. Then they'll, you know, the foster family will leave and come back and pick them up. So we always want to encourage that relation, you know, foster that because even after a child goes home and reunifies, that foster parent is still going to be a big part of their life hopefully, you know, because they've spent so much time now in this home. Um, you don't just want to strip that from them. Um, you know, you don't just want to take that away and, and then never have, you know, see that person again. You know, that's traumatic. That's traumatic for a child to have to, you know, they lost a family going to the foster home. They adapted to the foster home, but then they're going to totally lose the foster home going back to the family. That's just, you know, that's just a re-trauma Organization. I guess that's how you say it all over again. Um, but we do generally, you know, when a child comes into DFS custody, we, we generally do an icebreaker meeting, what we call an icebreaker. Um, and that's where we meet, you know, with the, the foster parents and the biological parents. And, you know, the biological parents have the opportunity to tell the foster family what the child likes, what they don't like, what they, you know, what their schedule looked like. Um, what kind of food do they like? What don't they like? Do they have any allergies? Do they, you know, so we really try to, and then the foster family is able to introduce themselves to the parents and, you know, give a little bit of information about what their schedule in their or routine in their home looks like, you know, and things like that. So that's, oftentimes very helpful. Yeah, that's pretty neat. Um, that makes me think of another, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Joyce. Yeah, I found that in, in, in my case, um, <laughs> there was an attempt to have that uh, icebreaker meeting, but um, um, it just never happened. And it has, has kind of kept a, um, almost like a envy, the parent is envious of the foster parent and also uh, skeptical and kind of has a 
um, resentment towards a foster parent. And so, I mean, the icebreaker hasn't happened and the child is very young. But then I also know that in terms of me being the CASA, I've met with the parent and I do meet often with the foster parent and see the child. And even to the extent of a request, like the, uh, my parent said, oh, um, I gave my child a toy and um, I really would like to see and you know, see her use it. And it's a toy that lights up at night. So I just put in a simple request to the foster parent. Can you take a picture of this child using the toy or using the journal or whatever, and then send that picture to me and that way it gets sent to mom. And mom has, uh, you know, she's uh, realizing that, yes, well, I have seen my child using the toy, something I gave her or something. It gives her a little bit more comfort in knowing that, you know, the request was made, the foster parent did it. And just that kind of still having that relationship, but also being the one that's the liaison between the two of them as a CASA. Right. Yeah, I think I... Yeah, I think it's important to build that relationship, you know, and the kids are seeing that too, you know, or, you know, they're, they're seeing that, that the, the adults working together or, or they might be seeing the exact opposite, you know, obviously we want them to, to try to see everybody working together. Um, In your experience, Jess, how often do you, once, if, say a child is successfully reunified back with his or her parents, how often do foster parents of that child almost serve as a, as a support, a continued support moving on for the whole family, not just the child, but just the parents in, as well? So that's going to depend on how that relationship evolved through the, you know, through the processes. I've got some cases where, um, you know, the uh, it's been years and the foster families are still connected with the biological families, and you know, they're they might watch the kid if mom can't find daycare for a day, or you know, or the kid's sick and can't go to daycare. You know, there's, um, you know, and, and but then I've had it also on the other end of that spectrum where it's just you know everything's cut off, and unfortunately, there's not much we can do about that. Um, you know, the, the parents do, it's like Miss Joyce said, they do envy and, um, you know, they, they, some parents aren't fans of the foster parents, even after their kid has spent a year in their home, you know, it, does, it just doesn't matter to them, you know, um, so they, they resent almost the, you know, the foster parents and, um, and, and sometimes that contacts come just completely cut off. And like I said, unfortunately, there's really not much we can do about it, um, you know, other than encourage it initially and, and throughout the process, you know, we, we keep trying to encourage that and just try to get everybody on board with, you know, maintaining that contact. Yeah, good, that makes sense. All right, so now thinking about the end of your involvement, so, my understanding is you kind of had two different routes. One, re, you know, the, a trial home placement and child goes back home. Second would be moving it to permanency because reunification did not happen. So thinking about a trial reunification, can you explain, uh, so let's say it's going, it's going well, parents have completed or nearly completed their case plan. How do you um, kind of close a case as successful reunification? So we'll, it, it's, it's really easy to see, you know, parents doing the right thing. That's, you know, that's one of the easiest, it's easier to see the good than it is, you know, sometimes they, as much as they try to hide the bad. Um, you know, I, with my cases, I generally try to gradually um, transition the kids back into the home. So it may start, you know, they, it, say we have an eight year old that's been having four hours a week visits, you know, split up in two. So they have two, two hour visits a week. I'm going to, first, I'm going to make I'm going to make them able to have a whole day visit, you know, so they're going to go visit with, with mom or dad or, or both um, in the home, maybe unsupervised, you know, for a whole day. And we're going to see how that goes. And then, you know, we're going to, we're going to do that a couple times for a couple weeks and then they're going to go spend an overnight. So then they're going to go and they're going to, you know, and we're, and we're going to do that for a couple weeks. Then they're going to go and they're going to spend the whole weekend and we're going to see how that goes. And all the while, you know, the kids are going back to the foster home. So they're, they're telling foster parents what's going on, you know, or, you know, they're talking about how their weekend went. And, you know, so we're getting some subtle clues and information, you know, even though, you know, the parents are going to swear that everything is going great, um, which most of the time by that point it does, it is going, it is really going great. 
Um, you know, and, and once we've had a, you know, a few weeks of successful extended visits, then we do the trial home placement. And that's where the kid goes back into the home full time with the parents. Um, during that time, we check in quite often. It would be multiple times a week. And, and usually there's still a family interventionist involved. The CASA is still involved. You know, so it's multiple people checking in multiple times a week just to make sure that everything is going good. Um, you know, if the child is in school, we're checking in. Are they, are they attending school? Are they, you know, um, if there's a therapy, you know, lots of times there's a therapist involved. How are they, you know, what's this, what's this kiddo saying to you about, you know, being back in the home? Um, and the trial home reunification usually lasts for at least a couple months. Um, you know, by the time we've reported it to the court that they've, you know, that they've started this trial home placement or, or, you know, there, there's usually still a couple months where we're able to monitor that before we go back into court and say, okay, we're ready to rescind custody to the parents. Um, you know, which at that point, our job would be done. Um, you know, and, and the kid would be home full time. DFS no longer holds custody of the child. Yeah, we may stay involved again for another, you know, couple months or so just to monitor the situation and make sure that everything stays successful. Um, but that's how that, that's usually how the trial reunification works on my on my cases. Yeah, and I always think that's so interesting because the trial during the trial reunification, DFS still holds custody. So yes. just in case something happens. Okay. Right. Yep. Um, do most of your, your reunification, once you're like very, very close to reunification, how often do you utilize a trial home placement? Always. It's always, yeah, almost always, unless something comes up and the court is saying, send that child home. You know, we, we almost always start with the trial home placement and it's, it's better for the kids. You know, like I say, it's a, it's a gradual transition rather than a, you know, rip them out and, and put them, put them back. Cause it's a, it's a shock. It really is. There's a big difference between a foster home and a, and a family home. Um, you know, the, it's just, you know, there's a big difference um, between the two in the condition of the home and the, the materials, the things in the home, you know, it's, it's a lot of kids don't have that, you know, when they go back, some kids don't want to go back home, you know, sometimes they want to stay in the foster home or they're torn between the two. Um, you know, I had, I just, I did a foster home visit a couple weeks ago with a little boy who's close to going home. And he's, you know, he was, he was so bewildered about what he was going to do with his Batman sheets. You know, the foster mom had said, you know, you'll be able to take your sheets to moms. And, and he was just like, you know, he just, it took him a while to understand that he wasn't going to be going back to foster home, you know, once he, once he went home with mom and that he could take those sheets, you know, he could take those sheets with him. But it was just, I mean, you could just see the wheels spinning for, I mean, and it was several minutes that those wheels spun, you know, of him trying to figure that out. Yeah, I can just, Im oh, I can only imagine just how complicated and confusing that could be. Mm -hmm. It is. Um, any, anybody have any questions about the actual final kind of permanency reunification before I move to, if that doesn't happen? All right, then just my last kind of session for you is what happens if if we actually, I'll back it up a tiny bit to about the nine month mark. Can you kind of chat about what a PPC is briefly and then how you change if per reunification is not looking likely what do you do okay, so at the nine month mark of a child you know coming into DFS custody we go to uh, like Lauren said PPC it's a permanency planning committee and that is a, a team of DFS uh, administration and there's usually somebody from PBH which is prevention and behavioral health um, you know, the, the CASA comes in for that and is able to give an opinion. The foster parents are usually able to come in and give an opinion. Um, but the, the DFS worker ultimately presents the case. Oh, our attorney is there also, by the way. Um, we present the case, why the case came in, what we have done, what services we've offered, what was on the case plan, what have the parents done. And at that point, we request, depending on the progress that they've made, um, what the goal should be. So should the goal remain reunification, like parents have done really good, you know, they're almost there, we're going to keep the goal reunification, and we're going to keep, you know, moving forward with those services. Or if the parents have done 
you know, practically nothing. They've made very minimal progress. This kid's not going home. You know, at that point, you know, you know, you pretty much know that these, they're not going to get it together. This child's not going to be able to go home. Then we request a goal change. Um, you know, usually it's, it's termination of parental rights for the purposes of adoption is the goal that we're requesting. Um, you know, sometimes we'll have somebody who's filed for guardianship and that, you know, that person may be appropriate and we want to look at that, you know, then we can request the goal um, to change to guardianship with a, with a known resource. Or sometimes we have teens that aren't old enough for APLA because APLA is so frowned upon these days. Um, you know, sometimes it's guardianship and it's listed with an unknown resource because that's our goal. We want our goal to be guardianship with somebody. We just don't know who that somebody is going to be yet. Um, you know, so we're trying to, we're going to try to wait and let this kid build some connections, maybe a school teacher, a step up, you know, and say, Hey, you know, let's, let's try her in my home, you know, for a little while and see how that works. Um, so there, there are different goals that we can choose from. Um, like I say, the most, the, the most often chosen goal is, is termination of parental rights for the purposes of adoption. Um, sometimes we do concurrent planning, so we might pick um, TPR, but we might also keep reunification on the table, you know, for that parent that might just be walking that line, um, where we've got a lot of hope still, you know, that they can, we, we, we know they have the ability to do it, and we think they probably will, but we're just not quite sure yet, you know, so we, we still have to keep, because kids deserve permanency. Um, you know, they're in the whole time they're in foster care, they're in limbo. And they really, you know, they might not say it and they might not ask it, but they, they want to know what's next. You know, they really do want to know what's, what's next for them. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> say you end up changing the plan. Um, you know, reunification is not possible any longer. How do you prepare to transition your case to a permanency worker? So we do a summary, like a case summary of, um, you know, and, and it's mostly, that summary is mostly geared towards the, the children. Like what needs does the children have? What services have they been involved with? How have those services gone? You know, what do they need moving forward? We do put little, little bits in there about the parents and what they've done and haven't done and you know things like that but um so once generally once the permanency planning committee changes the goal to something like termination of parental rights the the child's part of my case will be split off and those children and the children alone in their own separate cases will be transferred to the permanency unit where they will be assigned to a permanency worker um, I keep the parents case stays open on my caseload and I keep working with the parents until we have a court order from the judge changing the goal. So that's important. We have to have that. I can't stop working with parents um, until the judge officially changes the goal. Um, you know, or, or we could possibly have our reasonable efforts withheld and, you know, and that starts a whole nother firestorm. Um, you know, so that's, you know, there, that would be the, the instance where there's two different units involved. So the permanency unit may be open with, with the kids um, and the treatment worker is still open with the parents. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, so that's uh, interesting to remember that, that there, it is possible for a period of time to have two workers kind of doing two different things. Yep. And I'll say, because I've had a couple of CASAs be, conf uh, be confused, rightly so, because it's a little bit confusing, um, you know, if the plan changes to termination of parental rights for purposes of adoption, but say the court hearing isn't for another two months, that parent, that family can continue and should continue working on their case plan with their treatment worker, because there's a chance, it might be a small one, but there is a chance that they can complete that case plan in that, in that period of time. Right. And I, and I try to explain that to my parents. It's not ever, yes, the goal may have been, you know, we have requested this goal change and internally we've changed the goal, but until the court does it, you're still, you know, you still have to try to get to that finish line. Um, you know, so don't stop, don't stop now just because you've heard the words termination of parental rights. Like, you know, I know that's a flustering, but let that put, let that light the fire under you, you know, to, to really push it this last mile. Yeah, and I've had a couple of cases where the parents have gotten it together in that last, you know, month or two, but really the issues were not, uh, you know, the, the lengthy ones, such as substance abuse and, and, you know, mental health or something like that, so it was a little bit easier, but and just in terms of not needing that time requirement, but yeah, it is kind of the, the final fire. It is, yeah. Yeah, but until the judge 
terminates parental rights, that family should and, 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 and could continue to, to work on the case plan. Until, so I don't know that it's necessarily terminate because there's so, there's different hearings after, even after, but the judge has, so, so my, once we go to PPC, if, if we decide that the goal needs to change to termination of parental rights, then my attorney files that motion with the court requesting the goal change. And the judge makes an order, like the judge orders that. If he orders the goal to be changed to termination of parental rights, then I can close my part, then that's it for the parents. Um, you know, once the judge has said, yep, I'm changing the goal, it's termination of parental rights now, um, then, I'm, then my job is done. You know, so I close my part of the case, the kids still stay open with the permanency unit, and that starts a whole nother sort of timeline. So they still have post-permanency reviews where the permanency workers go, and they'll, they'll explain this to you a whole lot better than me, um, but the, you know, the permanency workers keeping the court up to date with how the child is doing. Um, you know, the, I think the visits, they drop from weekly visits to monthly visits, you know, and, and the permanency worker will eventually do a final visit, you know, so they're still, but that's the only thing the parent is still getting is the visits. Um, they can, the parents can still work on their case plans. They're just not going to have my support anymore at that point. Yeah, good, good point. And we will, in our final third session, really dive into permanency and talking about all the things that Jess just mentioned. But yeah, so when the judge cha officially changes the permanency plan to something other than reunification, so my, most likely termination parental rights, the treatment services stop. But yes, parents can continue to work on their case plan all that alone, you know, without the support of, right. this, of the division. Right, like their family, the family interventionist is going to go away. Um, you know, any services that we were providing to them, so any of the contracted agencies that we were working with, all that stuff will close if we get, you know, if and when we got to the point of a termination of parental rights. Yeah. So did that spark any questions about kind of that transition process? Uh, Shelly, go for it. So um, Jess, thank you so much for all of this information because I feel like this is what I know the least about with my cases and it's probably because of the kids that I work with, but this has just been awesome. So thank you for that. But I guess my question is how do, as a CASA, do we help you most along this process? So I, I mean, I, I have worked with amazing CASAs. I don't, I don't know. And I was actually thinking about this this morning as I was getting, you know, doing my final preparations for this little training or, um, you know, I, I don't know of one CASA that I could say I have not worked well with. Um, now, I know that some other workers have heard some complaints and, you know, whatever, but um, usually the, the complaints that I've heard is really just about CASAs maybe overstepping a little bit, you know, or um, trying to go over the worker, you know. I just, you know, my CASAs have been helpful. I've had some that have requested records and once they got the records, they've shared them with me. Well, that has saved me so much time, okay. you know, because, um, you know, I, and it's just, it, it's time consuming to do that stuff. And, and it is very helpful for you to, um, for you to do that. And for you guys to continue to check in with the families, you know, and, and if you have a concern, tell me about it. You know, I, I want honest advice and opinions. If you think something can be done for a family that I'm not doing, please tell me don't surprise me at court with it. You know, don't come into the court hearing and say, well, DFS has not done this. And, you know, because that's going to, I'm going to be like, wait a minute, you know, but they never told me that, you know, before this, you know, so let me know if there's really something that, um, that you guys think that could be done that maybe not, it's maybe something I just overlooked, you know, um, and, but just, and then also understand that we've got more than one case. Um, you know, for example, right now, now, my, my case numbers are not that high, but I have 11 kids in care right now and seven kids that are not in care, you know, so uh, my, my case number, my, I might just have 10 cases, but I'm all together dealing with, you know, 11, I can't even add right now, but all these kids, you know, I've got 11 kids in care and seven and seven not in care that I'm, that I'm tasked with making sure that they stay safe. And that's not even talking about the issues that these children have. I've got one in an RT, a residential treatment center in Virginia. I've got one in a residential treatment center in Pennsylvania. I have one that just got back from an RTC in Virginia and going off the rails, you know, so it's, there's a lot involved, you know, and then the one child I talked about with the medical issues, she's an intact, you know, family case, but I've got to keep a close eye on them. Um, you know, so there's just, 
you know, sometimes we can't sometimes jump on things right away. You know, we need to, a lot of times with us, it's putting out the fires as they come. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, good, Shelly, that's an awesome question. And Jess, following on that, what's the best way for CASA volunteers to communicate with you? Do you prefer email, text message, phone calls, visit, what do you prefer? I prefer emails or text, emails are always easier for me. I've got access to them all the time. Um, you know, it's, and it's easier for me to shoot off a response via email rather than on the, like if you call me, I may be meeting with a client somewhere and I might not be able to answer. Um, you know, same thing with a text message. Like I may not, I may see it, but if I'm meeting with somebody, I might not respond right away. And then I'm terrible at that, forgetting about it, you know, and, and not, but if it's an email, like I'm sitting at my computer a lot, um, you know, and I always have my emails up. So those emails are always dinging or I'm always going through my emails. Um, so emails probably would be the best way for me anyway to, to communicate. Yeah, I've heard that from a lot of DFS workers. That's helpful. And then you can always, if you can't address that issue right then and there, you can flag it or, you know, so it sticks out in your email. If I, I don't know this answer right this second, but, you know, I, I need to come back to it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and with communication as well, so CASA volunteers, um, the, I love the idea of if you're getting a, rec a record anyway, um, to be able to share it with your DFS worker. So if you all remember it in pre-service training, we talk about who is a party to the case, meaning who can receive information about a case. And remember that DFS is a party to the case. They are the ones that currently hold custody. So a lot of CASAs do a great job of saying, hey, you know, I'm going to the school anyway, or now I guess they're just contacting the school and say, hey, I'm getting the, you know, the report card. When I get it, I'll share it with you. It just saves the DFS worker from having to do, you know, do that same action and saves the school from having to send it, you know, two or three or four times. Um, so saying like, hey, I'm going to do this, you know, I'll share the information when I get it. So remember, you are able to share, you know, any and all information with the DFS worker. Yeah, and, and I hope, you know, most of the times with me anyway, I'm, I'm hopeful that other workers do it too. But if I get, you know, if I get records that might be difficult for you guys to get, like they were talking about earlier, you know, substance abuse records or mental health records, when I get them, I share them with you guys too. So it all goes, you know, it, it, it should be a very smooth, you know, process. There's some cases that are just going to be dumpster fires all the way through, but, um, you know, with with working together, you know, we can try to make that process as smooth as possible. <laughs> yes, absolutely. All right, any final questions for Jess? All right, Jessica, thank you so much for doing this training. This was awesome. Um, Not it's a problem. Super helpful. So we start with investigation. This is our second uh, part two with treatment, and then uh, join us next our next round for permanency. So we're going to wrap up our third process. So um, you know we'll be able to listen about what happens when reunification does not happen.